Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. It's good to see everyone. And thank you to those who are joining us online. We thank you for being part of our worship service today as well. Several announcements to go through this morning. <clears throat> First of all, if you have a cell phone, would you please check that for us to make sure it's on silence? Uh, we appreciate that. That'll help us during our time of worship. And if you have a special prayer request, the cards that are in the back of the chair in front of you, you get that filled out for us. We'll collect that during the course of our service this morning. And, of course, we'll allow your prayer request at the Shepherd's Blessing. Some reminders for the month of April. <clears throat> Excuse me. Spring work day this coming Saturday, 9 o'clock to noon. There are some jobs listed on a post downstairs for those who will be doing inside and outside work. Look forward to seeing as many who can join us as possible. Sunday, April the 14th, next Sunday, our growth group celebration. Every year, at the close of our growth group time together, we have a celebration for all the growth groups to come together. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer for what you can bring for the meal that day. Of course, if you're attending, let your group leader know as well that you're planning on attend. We'll collect the number of are going to be attending as well for that also, please. Sunday, April 28th is Harmony Sunday. Every year we do try to celebrate our diversity as a congregation here. Uh, there will be song workshops on Friday and Saturday evening. Uh, we'll have a fellowship, me fellowship meal on that Sunday as well, so please mark your calendars for that also. We're doing our diaper giveaway <coughs> Excuse me. on Saturday, May the 11th. Um, donations of size of diapers will be needed. Diapers needed by Sunday, May 5th. Uh, you can let our sister Miranda Lawhorn know if you can help with the distribution of the diapers on Saturday, May 11th. So please mark that in your calendar. And if you can help us out that day as well, that would be very appreciated. And please give your name to Marinda. Also, Walk for Water is scheduled this year on Saturday, July 13th. We're going to have it here at the building. Uh, it would be 9.30 a.m. Uh, for our check-in and, of course, our registration. And our walk will begin around 10. Uh, it's going to take place in our neighborhood, around the building. Uh, the website is up and running, so you can sign up now to participate. You could also get your uh, sheets ready for those who may want to uh, contribute to the Walk for Water. And, of course, we'll have an uh, opportunity for snacks and light lunch here will be provided. If you have questions, you can talk to Brother John Quinnen. He is going to help direct us and lead us in our Walk for Water again this year. Okay. A couple other things for reminder. We have been blessed with those who have volunteered to help us with our elementary teaching. Um, Sister Suzanne Archibald. We have uh, Sister Barbara Waltz, Watts, excuse me, and also Sister Ann Colazzo. Now, it's Ann Colazzo. It used to be Ann Siegler. She is going back to her maiden name. Uh, if you look downstairs this morning or head take a look downstairs, the room is all set up for those young people this morning, ready to go. So uh, grateful to those sisters for taking the time to get things ready to go for us. And, of course, the uh, enthusiasm they have around it as well. We're grateful for that. For that. One final announcement I have for us as well this morning our Compassion Sunday. At this point, we have collected over $6,000 from Compassion Sunday. Um, and there are others who still want to contribute to it, so we'll give them opportunity for that. Uh, I do want to, on behalf of the leadership, thank the congregation for your generosity, for your compassion, for those of others. Our next leadership meeting is a week from tomorrow. We will decide how we'll distribute the funds at that meeting, and of course, we'll give you an update as to how they're going to be used in the support for our community as well as those who may be here in the country as well okay and thank you everyone for doing that I know that was a lot to digest in one morning we're going to go to Heavenly Father in a word of prayer so I will today go silently in prayer to get our minds focused on worship for a moment and then of course I'll lead us in prayer let's bow together Almighty and most holy Father, humbly we bow before you this day, grateful for dear God for the ways that you've guided and directed our lives right up to this very moment. We are grateful we have a time to approach your throne, that we may speak with you, may bring before you our hearts, our thoughts, our intention and purpose this first day of the week. It is always our desire that our worship be honorable before you, and all that we present, of course, brings honor and glory to your name. You are such a wonderful Father, a good God, to take care of us continually. We're reminded of Jesus, our Redeemer, at your right hand, interceding for us always. Again, dear Father, we're thankful. This moment is made possible by his sacrifice.
by his willingness to come and to open our relationship with you again. We thank you. As we lift our voices in song, as we take our time to consider the things that are part of our glory and honor unto you again, help us to renew our spirits, to strengthen our faith, to deepen the hope that lies within each of us. And as always, Almighty Father, we express our love to you in all that we do. Thank you, dear Father, for being with us. It's in Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. That sounds good. You can hear me, right? That's bad. Our first song would be, I'll be listening. I need everyone to... Let's sing together. It sounds so beautiful when we sing together. So let's try to sing together. That's right. See how? Yeah. Just like that. Just like that. <laughs> when the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior the cause I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere. Listening, I'll be somewhere. Listening, I'll be somewhere. Listening for my name. And if my heart is right when he calls me, if my heart is right, I will hear. If my heart is right when he calls me i'll be somewhere listening for my name oh i'll be somewhere listening i'll be somewhere listening i'll be somewhere listening for my name Oh, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my robe is white when he calls me, if my robe is white, I will hear if my robe is white when he calls me I'll be somewhere listening for my name oh I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Amen. See, that sounded so wonderful. You got to keep it up for me. What's the next one? There's not a friend. There's not a friend like the Lord. There's not a prayer like the lonely Jesus singing, no, not a one singing, no, not a one. None else could hear all our souls deep. Jesus singing, no, not a one. I'm singing, no, not one, but I tell you, Jesus knows all about our struggles. I know he 
will God till the day is done? Oh, no, there's not a friend like the Lord Jesus singing, no, not one singing, no, not a one. Friend like there is so high and holy singing, no, not one I'm singing, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly singing, no, not one I'm singing, no. Not a one, and I'll tell you, Jesus knows all about our struggles, and I know He will guide till the day is done. Oh, no, there's not a friend like the Lord, Jesus singing, no. Not one I'm singing, no, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near of singing, no, not one I'm singing, no, not one. No night so dark but his love. Can cheer us singing, no, not one I'm singing, no, not one I'll tell you, Jesus knows all about our struggles. I know he will guide till the day is done, oh, no, that not a friend like the Lord Jesus singing, no, not one I'm singing, no, not one. Amen. First scripture reading today is from Psalms 133. How good and pleasant it is when the Lord, when God's people live together in unity, is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe, as if the dew of Hermon just were falling on Mount Zion. And there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Second reading is from 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Do you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took, her, took him from her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on a bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, you have brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Well, good morning. It's uh, good to 
have you here? And uh, isn't this great weather for an eclipse, eh? Hey? <laughs> we'll see if it's great weather for an eclipse tomorrow, but it's great weather for an eclipse today. So, uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I do not have an eclipse themed sermon for you today. So uh, I feel like I'm letting the city down in that regard, but. Uh, you know, I didn't want to jam the traffic, you know, the throughways with, uh, with too much traffic. <laughs> so uh, we'll see, see what happens uh, tomorrow. Uh, if you have a prayer card, we'll uh, collect those at, at this time. And uh, as usual, if you uh, haven't had the chance to write it down yet, we'll do that. We'll collect them again later. Um, or if you uh, need to pick up uh, communion cups. Uh, There's some here and there's also some out the double doors at the back there. So what do you preach after Easter? (laughs) It's like, you know, that's as good as it gets, isn't it? You know, uh, uh, a full house, an empty tomb, um, you know, the, the, the victory has been won. It's the culmination of the, the gospel, the story of Jesus. And so uh, where, do you, where do you go from there? And uh, it, it's uh, always a little, little challenging this time. Uh, this year we have just uh, uh, a few weeks until we have Harmony Sunday coming up on the uh, 28th. Uh, so... Uh, Harmony Sunday, if you haven't been here for Harmony Sunday before, is an opportunity to uh, celebrate the diversity that that God places within his church and to uh, remind ourselves on the importance of valuing valuing that. And uh, and so we will um, have a, a, you know, we've got our guest speaker coming in, so we will have uh, worship and Bible class as, as usual in the morning. Uh, it'll be followed by a lunch, and um, the the lunch is an opportunity for you to share some of your culture, and uh, so what, or, or just a culture in general. But uh, the, start planning. What is your meal? What food are you going to bring? And so uh, we we encourage people to bring a food that reflects your cultural background, and. Uh, there's a possibility that this year I'm not going to do Vegemite sandwiches, and uh, and uh, <laughs> but let, well, you know, you know, I've been teaching that you know, man shall not live by bread alone. So uh, I want to just prove that Australians do eat something other than Vegemite sandwiches. You know, so uh, we'll we'll see what happens with that. So, uh, um, but. But we encourage you to, to put some thought into that and bring food and uh, usually, you know, a little card that just says what it is and where it's from, reflecting a part of this country or an international country, and, um, and, and we enjoy that. And after, after the lunch, we will have uh, a time of singing. I'm still working out all the details precisely for that, um, but uh, it'll be a time of singing after lunch before we, we're done for the day. Uh, because the guest speaker is a, a worship leader, we're looking at having uh, what I'm calling a new song uh, workshop on uh, Friday night and Saturday night. So that time of singing on, on Sunday will be an opportunity to share with the, the whole church um, the, the songs that we've learned. It's not invitation only on Friday and Saturday, but it's for those that want to get into the music and uh, and, and we'll open that up to other congregations as, as well. So a little more technical than we usually do on, on Sunday morning, I think. So that's what's, what's coming up. So for these few weeks in between now and, and Harmony Sunday, uh, what I'm, I'm going to be focusing on is, is looking at some of the other, I want to say some of the other resurrections in Scripture, but they're, they're really not resurrections. The idea of a resurrection, at least in terms of Jesus, is that Jesus was dead, he came to life, and that's the end of the story. Right? Uh, whereas when we, we look at other 
people that are brought to life throughout Scripture. They die, they come to life, and they die again. And so, it, it, I guess technically we're going to try and call it, I'll try to remember, to call them resuscitations <laughs> rather than uh, resurrections. Um, I, I may slip up from time to time. But there's a distinction between the, the comeback from death that Jesus experienced and that that others experienced uh, throughout, throughout Scripture. As we move through the Bible, we, we see an evolution of culture. Okay? It's a story, if you will, that, that unfolds. And, and so we start off with, with Abraham you know, as an individual. Abraham and his wife. In fact, Abraham is just part of his father's household and they travel together. Abraham isn't you know, even the head of his own household at the beginning of that story. But in time, Abraham becomes the head of his household. Abraham has promised to be the father of, of many nations. Father, you know, have descendants like the sand on the seashore and, and stars in the, the night sky. And, and so we see this growth. Of, but Israel, or, or was what comes to be known as Israel, is still not a nation. Right? Joseph is one of 12 sons. It's a, a big family group, right? As they would if all live together in, in, the, uh, in Canaan. And so there would be you know, 12 family units, at least, of the sons. There'd be the daughters. You know, there'd, there'd be grandsons. It's, it's a big uh, camp there, plus all the whatever servants and hired help they had. So you may be looking, you know, if there's 12 sons, you're looking over 100 people. You know, in that group. And so when they, you know, it's kind of like the circus comes to town when they have to pack up and move to the, to the next place. Only they don't load onto a train to, to get there. And, um, but, but it's still nothing like a nation, right? Uh, that, that size, even if it's over 100, even if it's 200, that's still hardly a, much of a village or a town, let alone a nation. So they, they, Joseph, we know, goes down into Egypt, stays there, uh, you know, and, and prospers. His family moves down. They stay there for about 400 years. And in that time, they grow from this large family group to a large enough group to be called a nation. And we don't know their, their size as they, you know, as they then in time leave Egypt. But it, it's a, we could see the growth, right? From Abraham, who is just the, the son of his father that, that heads off from Ur to, to a land unknown, to now it's a sizable people group. And, and they're going to go and they're going to retake, uh, using military force, they're going to retake Canaan and establish themselves as a legitimate nation, all with, with God's leading and guidance. So we see this sort of growth. Now, when Moses, uh, who leads them out of Egypt, Moses is the, the leader, he functions as a prophet, the mouthpiece of God. And after Sinai, at Sinai, God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. And the big focus, at least in his relationship with, with his people, is the tabernacle, and so he's, or, or the temple, and setting up the priesthood. And he says, this is how I'm going to communicate with you. Okay, I'm going to, to be present in the Ark of the Co- at the Ark of the Covenant in the temple, and that will represent my presence in the middle of the camp. And so God is is mediating Himself certainly through Moses, but also through the the tabernacle. And after Moses, the the role of the high priest is the one that people go to when they're seeking connection with God. We might jump forward and think of uh, Hannah as she goes to the tabernacle and she encounters Eli, who is the, uh, the, the high priest there at the time. That's uh, who she wants to communicate with because he's in touch. He's the closest person to God in the nation of Israel. And so the, this initial relationship is through the priests. But Hannah's son, Samuel, another great prophet, sort of following in the the footsteps of Moses, introduces a new era because he now anoints two kings. 
He anoints firstly Saul and then David. And what we're going to see is this transition that takes place in that, that God is going to work through the kings. Now that Israel has a king, the role of the high priest changes. Right? We don't know so much about the high priests during the reign of Saul and David and Solomon because God is working through these leaders, through these kings to bless and influence his nation. And there are still prophets around that speak into the lives of the kings, but the kings are the primary, um, what am I trying to say, the primary determiner of the welfare of the nation. If the king is faithful to God, if the king eradicates idolatry, if the king you know, emphasizes temple worship, then the nation is doing well. If the king is corrupt, if the king is looking at worshipping idols and, and has no interest in God, then the kingdom, the nation, is open to attack and, and pestilence and plague and whatever else uh, can go wrong. And so the relationship of the king with God becomes central. And then we, we go a step further because the, the kings, particularly in the northern kingdom at this point, um, just become so corrupt that, that God says, I can't even get through to them. And so he sets up, what we're going to see, uh, he, he brings along Elijah, another of these great prophets. So you have Moses, you have Samuel, you have Elijah. And Elijah really ushers in what we might think of as this period of prophets, where God is now speaking to his people. He's kind of given up on the kings. right? And he, he speaks through his prophets. They become the primary representatives of God to the nation of Israel. You want to know what God wants for the nation? Don't go to the king. Don't go to the king's prophets. Maybe don't even go to the high priest. But find yourself a prophet of God. And then you may get somewhere. You may hear a word from the Lord. And so there's this big uh, transition that takes, and we see this evolving over time. Now, the prophets are still interacting with the kings, just as they'll interact with the temple and they'll interact with the high priest, because they're still encouraging people to go and worship at the temple. But, and they'll still confront the kings and say, you're sinning, you're not drawing your people to God, you're not being the leader you should. But they, while they interact with them, they, God is using them uh, more directly than he is the other two officers. So Elijah is not the first of the prophets, but he functions as the most notable of God's prophets in introducing this new era of prophetic um, guidance that comes to its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. Last week we celebrated Jesus' victory over death. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Elijah comes to prominence through the, uh, during the ministry, the ministry, during the reign of King Ahab. And so we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 17 uh, for a little while here. And if you look at the end of chapter 16, we see that Ahab becomes the king. And then in chapter 17, Elijah shows up on the scene. And he's not happy. Chapter 17, verse 1 of 1 Kings. Now Elijah Tishbite, from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. <laughs> you want any indication that the prophets are kind of taking over the role of the kings? He's like, I'll decide when it's going to rain, or when we're going to get a frost, or the dew's going to fall in the next few years. Now Ahab, he actually... Uh, is the son of a guy that we don't know very well. His name is Omri. And you go, who's Omri? Well, Omri is the father of Ahab. He's also one of the most 
successful kings the northern kingdom had. Now, we don't know that from reading the Bible, because in the Bible, Omri is talked about from verse 21 to verse 28 of uh, chapter 16 of 1 Kings. So he gets what? Seven verses. But they've uh, found archaeological inscriptions that refer to the Israelites as Omriites uh, for multiple generations. And so Omri had enough wealth that he was able to build the city Samaria. And so on a political and an economic sort of level, Omri was the most successful king of the northern, northern kingdom. But in God's book, he barely writes a mention. Ahab, is his son, is not that much, is not that great of a king. Doesn't win as many battles. But he's notable, he gets a lot of space in scripture because of his wickedness, because of his ungodliness. One of the things that uh, Omri uh, manipulated or, or made to happen was that he, um, Ahab married Jezebel. And Jezebel is the daughter of the king of Sidon. Okay. Tyre and Sidon are two cities that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. They're in, in, in ancient world, they were the primary cities of Phoenicia. The Phoenicians were a sailing people that went out and spread across the Mediterranean and, and even down, um, yeah, down into Egypt and, and across the Mediterranean. And they established colonies in different places they went. Much later, the city of Carthage, you know, Hannibal and the elephants in the Alps and coming to attack the city of Rome, um, Carthage was a Phoenician colony um, as they spread out through, uh, through the Mediterranean. Very wealthy um, nation. And today it would sort of be where Lebanon is, if you're trying to picture it. And so Ahab, or his dad, whoever arranged this, this marriage with Jezebel, is, is seeking to expand both his military and trading influence in the region. And so just as Solomon created alliances with um, you know, a lot of other countries by marrying the, the, the daughters of the kings of these other countries, this is what Ahab is, is doing. And just like Solomon, we're told in verse 32 of chapter 16 that... Um, Jezebel, being a Phoenician, worshipped Baal. And in verse 32 it says, He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. And so he, he buys into this Canaanite or Phoenician religion. What made Jezebel different or unique compared to many of the other foreign princesses that were married into the... Uh, Israel's monarchy, is that she wasn't content to worship her God in private. She was very evangelistic. She wanted the whole nation to be worshipping Baal. And, and when you tie the worship of God to the success of, or the prosperity of a nation, that sort of makes sense. But she wanted to convert Israel to worshipping Baal and mostly they did. Baal, or Baal, is the god of the storm, god of the rain. He's kind of like Zeus in the, the Greek pantheon. And, and being the god of the rain means that he's also the god that brings uh, growth to the crops. Okay, So if, if Baal isn't on your side, you won't have food to get through the, the dry season. And so, in that sense, Baal is also a f the god of fertility. He makes things grow. He brings life to uh, the people that worship him. 
And so when we, all of that is the sort of the introduction there, that, that Ahab has married Jezebel, who's introducing Baal, and this is who Baal is. What's the first thing that Elijah does when he comes on the scene? Stops the rain. What's that song? Who stopped the rain? Um, it was Elijah. Um, and it, it was God working through Elijah. So Elijah stops the rain. That is a direct challenge, not only to Jezebel, but to the Canaanite Phoenician god of Baal. Elijah is saying, yeah, I can turn it on and off. Baal can't. What I want us to see in, in chapter 17 is once he has stopped the rain, that wherever Elijah goes from this point on, life breaks out. Okay, okay that's your takeaway today. Wherever Elijah goes from this point on, and we could say wherever God goes from this point on, life breaks out. Having confronted Ahab, in verse 2, we see that God tells Elijah to go to the wilderness. Go to the wilderness. Go to the east side of the Jordan. And when he's there, God says, here's a like a spring, a little seasonal brook. He says, just settle down there and you'll have water. And then he sends ravens to bring him food that he can eat. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure how much food I would eat that was brought to me by a raven, right? <clears throat> but uh, apparently for Elijah, you know, you take what you can, what you can get. Um, but, but if God's preparing that menu, I guess it's going to be all right, hey? <clears throat> so, um, so, so life breaks out. He goes into the wilderness, and when he's in the wilderness, rather than finding sand and dust and dirt and desertion, he finds water, he finds food, he finds life. And then he, the, eventually in the seasons, the stream dries up. And uh, then in verse 8, the word of the Lord comes to him again and says, Go to Zarephath. Right? So you all know how far Zarephath is from that east wilderness east of the Jordan. It's at, we're told, helpfully, that it's up in the region of Sidon. Do you remember where Sidon is? Do you remember who's from Sidon? Jezebel's from Sidon. He's going into the enemy camp. Right? He's, he's not just taking a trip to a resort town. He's going into the heartland of Jezebel. This is her home territory. It's not just her home territory. It's the home territory of Baal. And that's where God says, Hey, I want you to go somewhere where I can protect you and provide for you. I'm going to take you to the homeland of Baal. Now, perhaps if you think, well, Baal isn't real, that's no problem at all. Okay? But there were an awful lot of people that thought that Baal was real. And if they knew who you were, you may be in danger. But nonetheless, that's where God takes him. And, and the first thing that happens is he gets there, he meets this widow, and the widow, he, he asks her for some food, and she says, Food? Don't you know we're in a drought? Some joker turned off the rain. He says, if you'll do this for me, give me what food you have. In other words, demonstrate your faith. And he says, you'll be looked after. And so we see then that what happens is that um, in verse 12, As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar, a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. She's desperate. She's got no hope, no future. All she sees ahead of her 
is the last meal of oil and flour and then death. Elijah says to her, don't be afraid. He goes on and says, hey, will you use that to make bread for me? And then make something for yourself and your son. In verse 14, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up. The jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. And so Elijah stays with this widow. And the the jar of flour, the jug of oil never runs dry all the time that he is with her. And there's this miraculous provision. But it's not just flour and oil that he's giving her. Remember where, where she was when he met her? Preparing to die. What, God, what, what Elijah, or God through Elijah, gives her is oil and flour and life. Because wherever Elijah goes, life breaks out. And then having demonstrated that Baal is impotent, okay? Baal doesn't contain the rain. Baal can't give food to people, but God can. Yahweh can control the rain. Yahweh can give food, give life to people. He doesn't even need the rain to do that. And so Elijah has demonstrated this impotence of Baal. He now turns his attention to another god, we don't, it it's not, doesn't show up a great deal in scripture, but that is the, the god of death in the Canaanite religion, the god of the underworld. And he has the name of Mot, M-O-T. And, and as we read just a lo- uh, earlier from Daryl, we see how Elijah goes through this process of bringing this widow's son back from death. From death back to life. Um, so, so let me just explain this to you. Traditionally, these two gods, Mot, the god of death, and Baal, the god of rain and thunder and fertility or life, are perpetually engaged in a struggle, in a battle. They're enemies. And what would happen is that each fall after the harvest, the god of death would triumph. Okay? Baal would disappear. And, but then Baal would be resurrected come the spring. And the spring rains. And, uh, and the crops grow. And the harvest comes in and they're all praising to, to Baal. And so this becomes this cycle that's always ongoing, this conflict between the two gods. But sometimes there's an extended period of, of drought. And so not only are they locked in this annual battle, <laughs> annual struggle, but if Baal triumphed in, in a big picture, there would be a seven-year cycle of fertility and growth that would ensure and if he were vanquished by Mart, seven years of drought and famine would ensue. And so when they're in the, a drought and experiencing drought, there's a real chance that the, the Canaanites and the Baal worshippers are going to give the credit to Mot, because he's the god of the drought, the god of death, the god of the underworld. And so rather than giving the credit to Yahweh, So Elijah has taken on Baal. Now he he has death right in front of him. He has evidence of Mot's power and the grief that comes with that, the the pain and the anguish that 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 brings to to this mother. And, And then God, through Elijah, goes into the underworld, if you will, and brings that child back, restores life, to that person. You see, Mot couldn't keep him. <laughs> Death couldn't keep him. The underworld couldn't keep him. When Yahweh says, I'm going to get that child. I'm going to get that person. I'm going to bring him back and restore him to his mother. Then Mot has no power to resist that. 
And so Elijah has defeated Baal and now defeats the god Mot. The whole Canaanite way of understanding how the world works has been shattered. The two primary gods responsible for the seasons and for death, for the essential food, the essential things of life, have uh, been shown to be powerless in the face of God. And so I think that's what's happening here in this story. That God is saying, yeah, Ahab, you want to marry Jezebel? You want to introduce Baal worship? Well, let me show you who I am. Let me remind you who I am. And and he does that through Elijah. Wherever Elijah goes, life breaks out. I want to take just a moment to show this comparison between Moses and Elijah. Because I think there's a lot of parallels between the two. The plagues that Moses, again, it's always God through Moses, but the plagues that Moses um, poured out on Egypt correspond pretty closely to many of Egypt's gods. Again, Yahweh showing how he could overcome the local deities. Uh, As they come out into the wilderness, Moses and the people of Israel are fed manna by God, right? He gives them food and water in the wilderness. Um, Elijah, fed by God's ravens, as we just just saw. Uh, Moses leads Israel to Mount Sinai and into covenant with God. He gives the Ten Commandments and he, he says, Israel, will you come into covenant with God? Will you accept these rules? Will you make God your God? Will you be his people? And they say, yes, we will. And then if we were to keep reading to chapter 18, there we have the big showdown. This time it's on the top of Mount Carmel. Uh, between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. But once the prophets of Baal are consumed by fire from heaven, Elijah says to the people of Israel that are present, he says, okay, what are you going to do? You're going to worship Yahweh? You're going to be faithful to Yahweh or to, um, to Baal? You're going to keep worshiping Baal, um, the god of fire that got consumed by fire, right? So uh, we see there in chapter 18 and verse 36, um, 39, When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. That's what we call a revival, right? Um, And so then in the the next thing we see in point of comparison is that God appears to Moses on Mount Sinai. Remember when uh, he he passes by and Moses comes down the mountain, his face is glowing, and and God has said, I can't show you my face because that would kill you, but you can look upon my back. And then Elijah, uh, again if we keep reading, uh, we would find that Elijah goes to the same mountain. Sometimes it's called Sinai, sometimes it's called Horeb. But there God, Elijah is just despondent. Okay, After the big victory against the prophets, he's despondent. But God says, hey, I want to show you who I am. Uh, Because Elijah is looking for God to continue acting in the fire to continue acting with power. And and God says, I want you to go into that cave and and there's this wind that comes by. There's this fire that comes by. God says, no, that's not me. And ultimately, God reveals himself, but he does so in a gentle whisper. Sometimes, Elijah, when you're the only one, when the room is quiet, when all you can hear is a whisper, he says, that's me. It doesn't need to be a temple filled with thousands of people for me to be present. But God appears to Elijah much like he appeared to um, Moses and at the same location. Now when Moses dies, his body is not found and uh, likewise Elijah at the end of his life is recorded as being taken to heaven on a chariot. There may be other comparisons that you can, you can think of there, but um, they're pretty significant parallels. And as I said before, Moses introduces this era of the high priests. Uh, Then we have Samuel with the kings and Elijah is introducing this era of the prophets. The last point to note there is that in the life of Jesus, when Jesus goes up on the mountain, sort of as he heads towards the cross, he meets with two characters from the past. 
he's, he's transfigured. He sort of takes on a heavenly appearance. And, uh, and while he's there, he is joined by two people. And those two people are Moses and Elijah. And so we may say to ourselves, well, why Moses and Elijah, I wonder? Why are they the two that are uh, being, that show up there? Well, let's have a look at this comparison. You could add that, pretend you can see the, the column for Moses. But just as Elijah battles the gods of Canaan, and Moses the gods of Egypt, Jesus battles Satan and his demons. Right? Um, just as Elijah is fed by God's ravens in the wilderness, Jesus is fed by God's angel in the wilderness after his 40 days of fasting. 40 days that kind of match the 40 years that Israel wandered in the wilderness. Um, Elijah leads Israel in covenant with God on a mountain. Uh, Jesus teaches Israel sort of the new covenant in a sense with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. Uh, God appears to Elijah on Sinai. I don't have a comparison for that. Uh, raises, God raises, or Elijah raises the, the dead son in Sidon. Jesus also takes a trip to Sidon, okay, to Phoenicia. And while he's up there, he casts out a daughter, I believe, of a widow, um, casts a demon out of a, a daughter of a widow, uh, who is persistent in asking Jesus to, to heal her daughter demonstrating faith in, in Christ. Uh, Elijah taken to heaven, Jesus resurrected and ascending, and of course Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration while Jesus was there as well. And so we see this comparison. So when we say that wherever Elijah went, life breaks out, you know what we can say about Jesus? Wherever Jesus goes, life breaks out out. Whatever it was that Elijah was able to do, Jesus did and more. Jesus multiplies food. Jesus heals the sick. Jesus raises the dead. Jesus defeats death. Jesus assumes the throne of heaven. Wherever Jesus goes, life breaks out. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 tells us that he must reign Okay, Jesus must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death because we understand that yes, Jesus is on the throne of heaven, Jesus is reigning, but all his enemies haven't been defeated, right? Anyone had a bad day this week? Right? That enemy hasn't been defeated, right? It gave you hardship. It might have just been that hip of yours that bothers you every time the weather changes, but it's that hardship that hasn't yet been defeated, but it will be. Because Jesus is on the throne, and, and in time, he will win the victory against every, all of that. But for now, he has won the battle. He's won the conflict and not the war. But it says the last enemy to be defeated is death. I, I view death as our ultimate enemy. It's the last one that Jesus will overcome. But, and that's what gives such significance to his resurrection. Because it says, yes, this, this greatest enemy, the enemy that is introduced as the only consequence God gives at the beginning of the story in, in the Garden of Eden, he says, you take that fruit... And he's, the only punishment that he predicts to them is that you will surely die. And that's why death is then the last one defeated. It's the first consequence. It'll be the last one defeated. Everything else is just filling in the space between. And so Jesus demonstrates through his resurrection that his life is stronger than death. And so it doesn't just... When that, if that last enemy is destroyed, the resurrection isn't just a defeat of death, which it is, but it signifies a defeat of everything else. Right? If death is the last thing defeated, everything else has to be defeated beforehand. And so when Jesus says, yes, I'm going to take this victory, it means that he's taken victory over pain, over suffering, over hurt, over sin, over weakness, over temptation, over... You know, my, uh, 
my sins, my problems, my hardships, everything else that, that is not the way God designed it, we know that it's been defeated because death has been defeated. And it's the last thing. And so Jesus, where Jesus goes, life breaks out because Jesus is on the throne of heaven. As he was being executed, Jesus' disciple Stephen was given a vision of heaven. And in Acts chapter 7 and verse 54, we read there, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus is on the throne of heaven. Sin and Satan are going to try and bring us down. They're going to try and create doubt. They're going to say, hey, if Jesus won, why do you feel this way? If Jesus won, why did that happen? If Jesus won, what's going on in this world? If Jesus, and they'll, 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 they'll feed us those questions. They will try to help have us focus on what's wrong in life. They will try to point out our weaknesses and our failures. But just as God defeated the gods of Egypt, just as God defeated the, 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 the gods of Canaan, as he brought his people out of Egypt, as he restored his worship in Israel, Jesus has defeated Satan and death. Jesus has defeated sin and he's given us grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And right now, he's sitting on the throne of heaven. Little did that boy in Phoenicia, all those years ago, perhaps realized what God had done for him. Gone into the underworld, defeated the God there, and brought him back. I think that's what the resurrection is, right? That Jesus went into death, defeated whatever was there, came back, and one day, he's going to take us with him. Thank you for that wonderful lesson, Peter. Wherever God, Christ walks, light breaks out. Let us prepare our souls and hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper. Fountain free. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh, haste to the brink. There's a fountain of love from the source above. And he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call, tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's left, and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me, and this stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, 
thirsty soul, hear the welcome call, tis a fountain open for Good morning, folks. Acts 27. This is uh, Paul is being transported to Rome. Then Paul says to the centurion, unless these men abide in the ship, they cannot be saved. So the sol soldiers straightway cut the ropes and let the light boat fall away. A ship doesn't sink because of the water around it. A ship sinks because the water gets in it. The problems we have in our lives is the problems we let in it. Just like a ship, part of it, to keep it afloat is bailing out the problems. Bailing out the problems that are not ours and determining which problems that are ours and it's somebody else. My, my wife is always big to say, uh, this is not my monkey because this is not my service. <laughs> the idea, the strength in being able to bail out your problems is every week you stand before the Lord. You go to communion. And the things that are yours, you have to handle. The things that are not yours, you take them to the Lord. And you take them to the Lord and let him handle it. You commune with the Lord. We have a thing at 145 Inglewood Drive. You can come in and we'll give you dinner, give you a place to talk. We'll talk about your problems. We'll give you whatever solutions we have. But when you leave and that door closes behind you, you take your problems with you. Because at 145 Inglewood Drive, we have enough problems of our own to try to, get, to try to get to. I would encourage you to take every Sunday, you stand before the Lord, every Sunday you could take communion as a way to bail it out so you can stay afloat. Let us pray for the blood, the bread, and the cream. Father God, we come before you thanking you and praising you for life, health, and strength asking you that this bread which represents your broken body and this cup which represents your shedded blood will help us and keep us always strong. These and all of the blessed us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For he is good. His love endures forever. Everybody give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for he is good, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for he is good, his love endures forever, his love will reign forevermore, his power will reign forevermore, his grace will reign forevermore, his peace will reign 
Time now to uh, say farewell to those who have joined us online, our streamers. Uh, we thank God that they were able to join us, uh, that there's uh, the technology available that they can be with us in spirit, if not in, uh, in uh, physical form. We hope, pray to God that at some time, if it be his will, that they'll join us. So um, we'll also say a prayer now for uh, our uh, offering this morning, as well as the ones that the children are about to bring to us. So let's bow before him. Holy Father, we thank you, Father, for this time, for the sharing that we've had with those present and with those afar. We pray, Father, that our worship has been pleasing to you. And we thank you, Father, at this time for all that you do for us. And we know, Father, that we can never repay you for the love and the grace that you've provided for us. We ask, Father, that you take our offering this morning that we've prepared and that the children will bring to us, to you. And, Father, we pray that uh, we will spend it to bring glory and honor to your name. Again, Father, we ask you now to bless those that are departing. Be with them this week, Father. Help them, Father, to... Uh, to have you focused in their lives, and they bring that focus to those that they share in their world. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>